Today we're here planting marsh grass out on Kwani Marsh. Uh, it's the next phase in the Kwanakatog Marsh Restoration Project. It started with the dredging and now we're up here on the marsh. Save the Bay was out here most of the winter making sure that the drainage on the marsh was working properly so that when we're actually putting the plants down they have a great habitat to live in. You can see the plants behind me. Uh, we're starting in this section of the marsh planting to stickless. Um, so that's what we'll be doing today and there'll be volunteers over the next coming over the next few days planting about 1700 plants uh, across the marsh. I'm Wenley Ferguson and I work with Save the Bay and I coordinate Save the Bay's habitat restoration projects. Save the Bay has been a partner with Coastal Resources Management Council and the Salt Pond Coalition and the town of Charlestown on this restoration effort at Quantico Salt Marsh. We're on the east side of the breachway um, today, planting uh, some salt marsh grasses. And this is the it's mid May, May 15th, and this is the first day we started planting the salt marsh grasses. Um, our role at these projects is to come in and um, establish drainage and do uh, additional grading after the sediment has been placed on the salt marsh. In December and January of this uh, four or five months ago, Brennan, the contractor that did the dredging, pumped the sediment onto the marsh and graded it with bulldozers to a, um, to a design elevation. But uh, just like any project, um, sediment has moved and this is pretty fine sediment. So we've come in with a low ground pressure excavator and done like the grading behind me, that was very hummocky. Their large bulldozers weren't really able to grade down to salt marsh elevation um, because they were so big. So what we've been able to do with the state's low ground pressure excavator is come up with a final grading plan and allow the groundwater that is trapped in this in the sand that was placed to drain out. And as well, we uh, developed, as you can see behind me, some swales and drainage channels so that um, both the groundwater just on the um, inland side of where the sediment was placed and the salt water, the groundwater can flow out and then the salt water during some of the higher tide events can flow into the area where the sediment was placed. So that effort has started in February um, and we have been out here, it's now May, we've been out here since February grading and using the low ground pressure excavator to dig these larger channels. And then we have been digging by hand small little channels um, to again drain that groundwater from the upland edge or the upper edge of the sediment placement area to give that groundwater a path out. So as any of you who've been living in Rhode Island this spring know, it's been one of the wettest on record and following a very wet fall. So the groundwater table is very high. It's really important to allow that groundwater, give it a path to drain out um, or else uh, Phragmites, which is an invasive plant, can, could colonize the areas. Um, so that's, that's a, a key component of this phase of the sediment uh, placement. And once we get the plants in, um, we are going to be, well probably this summer, it will be more of a wait and see. We'll maintain the, the creeks and the channels, the small little um, runnels that we dug. Um, and then we will come out at the end of the growing season and monitor the site. Um, and we'll be partnering with um, the Estuarine Research Reserve. They will be looking at fish use, looking at the elevations um, with uh, folks from URI's Environmental Data Center. We're working with the EPA, um, Atlantic Ecology Division, looking at the soils and uh, a PhD student from URI is monitoring the soil conditions at each of our vegetation plots. Um, EPA is also testing, um, putting out seed um, that it was collected from the salt marsh. So the, all those little, um, uh, little dowels that you see in the marsh, that's their plots that they are testing uh, seeding methods. We have been doing some seeding um, more on a, a general or a wide scale basis where we're gathering seed that we collected last fall as well as in the high tide line in the marsh just adjacent to where the sediment was placed and casting it um, across the, the area where the 
sand was placed. This is a very large area and our salt marsh plants, we have about 16,000 plants to plant over the next uh, three to four days, but it will only cover a fraction of the surface area. So seeding is another great technique for getting uh, plants established. What we found at Ninigret um, Sediment Placement Project, the salt marsh restoration effort at Ninigret Pond that was conducted in 2017, is that we had a lot of uh, recolonization with seed, uh, especially the second growing season. So that's what we're hoping to see um, here at the Kwani Marsh. And even today, I noticed in the, the rack line where marsh grass and debris got um, swept up or um, washed up with the last big tide, we can see tiny little salicornia or pickleweed plants beginning to get established. So that's a good sign. That's an early colonizer of a salt marsh. So you can, you can see here where I'm standing on sand that was pumped onto the marsh and graded into the upper edge. Um, and just inland of me is um, a, a low point that we wanted to make sure that that groundwater didn't get trapped. So that's why we, we excavated this by hand, a little channel for that water to drain out. It's Thursday on Monday of this week. I think we had another inch plus rain. And so it has drained out. Um, so that's, that's important for any plants in this area. If I'm digging here, um, the soil is looking pretty good um, for root growth. Um, if in areas that aren't well drained, you get that um, anoxic black layer very close to the surface, and that is not good for root growth. Uh, so this is looking a lot healthier than it did a few weeks ago before we excavated this small little um, creek to drain the groundwater out. You could see like little snail shells. Um, and this is not a surprise here, Bob, where I notice this is a little bit of a depression and you can smell that soil. And if you look down here, see how close um, close to the surface, it's probably only a centimeter below the surface is that anoxic layer of um, soil. So this is an area uh, where the water uh, definitely does not drain as well. So that's why we need to keep doing a little more, you know, we're clearly not done with the, um, creating these small little runnels or channels for the water to drain off. But this area, for example, is not an area where we would conduct any planting right now. We're only gonna be planting in areas that have better drained soils. Good. Additionally, along with the salt marsh plants, at the spit, what I call the sand spit, that was um, built up, sediment uh, was placed on a, a former very narrow spit of land that was getting inundated more and more. It was eroding more and more with um, inundated each tide. Um, we built up the elevation of that with the sediment that was dredged from the breachway. And this February, we started planting beach grass, so uh, dune grass, um, on that peninsula. And the goal there was to both stabilize the sand um, right after it was placed, because of course, dry sand can get windswept. And um, also, we were the goal was to create a little bit of a dune habitat. And that area where the spit is located is a, a wonderful um, public access area that's been developed as part of this restoration project. The area where we're doing the salt marsh planting, our goal is to try to limit um, public access to this area because it's a restoration in progress. But meanwhile, we have a whole new area where the public can access and get to the shoreline here at the Quantic Breachway. Um, so a similar uh, effort was done on the west side of the breachway. Sediment was placed over there as well. We have done beach grass planting there, as well as um, we have the low ground pressure excavator digging some uh, swales to drain um, that groundwater off the marsh. And at that site, we because of our uh, the limited amount of plants we have, that site's going to be an area where we only um, do seeding, and we can see how you know compare 
the uh, recolonization of the two areas, the west side versus the east side. So it's a long, what we've learned at Ninigret, these are projects that um, take many years of um, both monitoring to determine uh, effectiveness and how, how the, the habitat is responding, as well as um, maintaining uh, these creeks and runnels requires significant maintenance after every single big rainstorm and large tide events. So um, maintenance of these projects is definitely a, a key component until the site's stabilized and it's recolonized with vegetation and that vegetation can help hold that sand in place. So you'll prob probably be seeing us out here for at least the next five years. At Ninigret we're on year three and we're looking at at least another three years of um, monitoring and adaptive management and maintenance. I'm, I'm Caitlin Chafee. I'm a policy analyst at the Coastal Resources Management Council. Um, we are kind of the lead agency for this project. We're the Coastal Zone Management Agency for Rhode Island. Um, so we secured the funding and are managing the grants and all the contracts that are involved. Um, we managed and oversaw phase one of this project, which involved getting a marine contractor. And we worked with JF Brennan. They're out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. So they came in with hydraulic dredges, two of them, and deployed them in the channel of the pond over here and, and right inside the channel and dredged. They kind of, the, they have a cutter head that disturbs the sediment, then it gets sucked through a pipe. Um, and they dredged about 70,000 cubic yards of material. And then that was piped onto the degraded marsh surface. And then they smoothed the material out with low ground pressure equipment. And so the idea was to, to transfer all that material onto the marsh and then get it close to our design elevations. And we uh, chose those design elevations based on the vegetation that we're shooting for. So all the different plants in the salt marsh have different um, ideal spots where they grow and that that's driven by how often those areas are flooded with tide with the tide and so we before we started our work we did plant surveys and we connected all that data to elevation and that helped us to determine what the growth ranges the elevation growth ranges were for each species so we took the species that we wanted to see grow back and we set those as our target elevation so Brennan's work was really to move the material, to do a first pass at grading and try to get the design close to where it needed to be. And then after they left the site, Save the Bay came in and have been fine tuning that work ever since. So they're working with much smaller equipment, making really fine adjustments to the grades and the elevations. They've been installing the, the drainage creeks that you see over here to help um, maintain drainage and prevent water from ponding on the marsh, which was kind of what causes the problems in the first place. And so this is really phase two. And we really couldn't do it without both, both teams of people. So Brennan was a great contractor to work with. They have the right equipment and, um, and then, but it's really necessary to have that kind of second pass where you can fine tune things and see where things are settling out and go back and kind of fix whatever needs to be fixed. So Save the Bay has been great um, helping us with that. And then, and then they're of course leading the planting effort, which is starting now. So, so if all goes well, we'll hopefully see some natural regrowth this year. But um, if it's anything like the project over in Ninigret that we did, and that was um, done in 2017, um, really next year is when things will probably start to take off in terms of plant growth. So fingers crossed, that'll happen at Kwani as well. Uh, my name is Suzanne Payton, and I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Southern New England Coastal Program here in Rhode Island. Um, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was very interested in um, salt marsh restoration and is working on salt marsh restoration across um, the region from Maine to Virginia where we work with partners. Um, in this situation um, we obviously are working with the CRMC and Save the Bay and NOAA who is the funder for for this project uh, and a bunch of other partners, Salt Ponds Coalition and um, you know all of the other partners, DEM who's the landowner uh, to restore the site. 
Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been very concerned about a species called the salt marsh sparrow. It's a species that nests only in coastal salt marshes. Uh, their entire worldwide distribution is between Maine and Virginia uh, in the U.S. and then they spend the winter in the southern part of the United States. So we have a big responsibility here in the Northeast for that for that species. Um, and we have recent research um, coming out of several universities, including the University of Connecticut, is showing that their populations have declined by 85% in the last 20 years. And much of that is due to habitat loss. So what they need for habitat is the high marsh vegetation, we call it, what people refer to as the marsh hay. And it's in those portions of the marsh that only flood typically a few times out of each month. And that allows the birds enough time to to mate and lay their eggs and raise their chicks until those chicks are, are big enough and strong enough to climb up out of the nest when the next high tide comes in. Um, so they're supremely adapted to nesting in this specific habitat type, but over time, as sea level has started to rise at a more rapid pace, it's outpacing the marsh's ability to, to keep up. So the elevation of the marsh relative to the tide is slowly decreasing. And what we've seen is that the, those marsh hay communities are, are transitioning to a more salt tolerant um, low marsh community. So um, the plants that typically would just be um, along the, ch the creek edges and um, in those areas that flood, the lower elevation areas um, that flood with each high tide, um, those plants are displacing and uh, replacing the plants that are less salt tolerant. So this site at Kwani um, had, I believe, almost no, I mean, there might have been, I remember walking out here, there were some small, really small patches of vegetation, but there was essentially no remaining habitat that was suitable for the salt marsh sparrow to nest in. So the, this site was selected to receive sediment, and the idea is that we'll build the elevation of the marsh help it to revegetate. Um, in some places where it's just a thin layer of sediment, we expect the marsh vegetation to grow right up through. Um, and in other places, we're gonna be planting to jumpstart the vegetation. Um, hopefully within five to 10 years, you know, this hasn't been done in Rhode Island um, much. We have a few sites, the National Wildlife Refuge um, conducted a few um, thin layer sediment placement projects over the last several years. Uh, and then there's a, a site at Ninigret that um, the CRMC work, working with uh, partners also um, did a couple of years ago. So this is relatively new and we are hoping that we'll learn a lot from it. So we have a lot of researchers from the EPA and the University of Rhode Island and others uh, really tracking and monitoring the vegetation. We'll be monitoring the birds. We're monitoring the, the salinities and um, how the elevations change over time, if the sediment's compacting or shifting. So um, there's a whole monitoring plan and a whole lot of partners working together to learn as much as we can to try and perfect this technique um, so that we can use it to help our marshes um, keep up into the future so we'll still have marshes here in Rhode Island and, and elsewhere. Um, and hopefully we'll have the right kind of marshes that the salt marsh sparrow can use so that we don't risk losing them altogether.